This is going to be the last video in the series about this uh, controller build, and this is going to focus on the DC power distribution within the enclosure. Um, sorry it's taken so long to do this video, but I've just been busy doing other things and trying to survive 2020. Uh, hope everyone is uh, doing as best as they can. Uh, hope next year will be better. So anyway, uh, power supply here. Uh, so obviously it converts AC to DC. It's 800 watts. And this one puts out uh, 56 volt, 24 volt, and 12 volts. And as far as amperage, uh, the 56 volt side of it takes up most of the amperage rating of the whole power supply. I think it's 14.3 amps. The 24 uh, volts, you can draw two amps, and then 12 amp volts is one amp. Um, and then uh, the next, the core of this uh, system is really these terminal blocks that, that compose the uh, DC bus. And so I was gonna show you detail about each terminal block so it'll make it easier to understand what's going on here. So this is the Phoenix Contact 3214-325 terminal block. So it provides a fusible link for each one of the DC circuits. And the good thing about it is that it allows you to manage both the positive and negative side of your circuit in one terminal block, rather than needing multiple ones. There's quite a bit of choice out there. Even Phoenix Contact has a bunch of different fusible uh, terminal blocks. But this one seems to be the most space savings, so that's why I chose it. Um, so this is the fuse door here, and it takes a 5x20 fuse. They want you to put it in the door here, and then as you close the door, it places the fuse into the holder. And so um, for the wires, the, the negative side always has continuity between these two points. And then on the positive side of the circuit, the continuity goes through the fuse. And so if you open the door like this, then the circuit is broken, as well as if the fuse blows, then the circuit is broken as well. And so, as you can see, the, there are binding posts uh, for holding the wires. So here's one screw, and this binds this one, this one binds this one. This one is accessed when the door is open here, and it's binding this one. And then this last one is bound through that screw. And so, uh, the one complicating factor here is these squares. You can see there's two, two rows of these squares. And then under the red wire, there's another two, and that's for the bridges. And so let me just grab one and mock it up. And so this is how multiple terminals would be bound together. And so there would be a terminal right next to it, and then they'd be bound using the, the bridges, just like other types of terminal blocks. And so this is what allows you to sort of turn this into a bus. So if you go to the Phoenix Contact website, you can look up these terminal blocks by their part numbers. So this is 3214325. Obviously, that's just the terminal block I just showed you. Uh, but what I wanted to point out here was these circuit diagrams. So hopefully now that you've seen the terminal block, at least in the video, these will make more sense to you. So the hollow circles are where the wire terminals are, are bound to the terminal block. And then these black circles represent the rows for the bus bars. And so it's just telling you that each circuit has two rows of bus bars here. So that's kind of useful. And then obviously this is the fuse. So anyway, I just wanted to point this out because it's not totally obvious what these represent when you're shopping around for terminal blocks on this website. So hopefully that helps. So back at the panel here, hopefully now it's easier to understand what's going on. Um, these are my little labels for the various circuits I have, um, but let me open up these and make it more obvious what's going on. So I'm going to open up all of these guys. So, so you can see the um, bridges. So you can see here this, this one bridge is, is binding together the first two terminal blocks. And it's a little harder to see, but underneath these wires is the blue bridge that's uh, binding the negative side of this circuit. So what that allows us to do here, in this case for these two circuits, is to bring in power once. So these are 12-volt uh, uh, DC from the power supply. And this is 
providing power for both of these circuits. So this is the CPU style fans that are on my gecko drives and then SC stands for spindle cooling. So that's the fan and uh, water pump that's out on the x-axis of the machine. And so those are both powered through this one wire and a common ground and uh, are fused separately. They have different fuse ratings. These are CPU fans so it's very small current and then uh, this is a, a bit better, bigger, um, I don't remember what it is offhand. But anyway, uh, now these the next seven terminal blocks are all for sensors on my machine. And as you can see here, they're bound together with these bridges. Um, it's kind of good to point out here, that's the utility of having two rows of uh, uh, bridge uh, connecting points, is that if I didn't have two rows, I couldn't do this, and I would have needed to have a, a bridge that was exactly the right length. But then, since I didn't have the bridge of the exact right, correct length, I just used two of them to bridge across. And it's uh, exactly the same as having a bridge that would be uh, perfectly as long as I needed, which was would be seven, seven blocks. So anyway, uh, that's kind of what the utility of having two rows is. And so um, we see here that uh, ZT is Z touch plate, and then these I1 through 5s are actually my proximity sensors. Um, and I color code these as well as the wires to kind of help me out. But as you can see here, in this case, uh, the power is coming in once again, uh, one wire. These, these powers are actually 12 volts, and they're not actually from the power supply, but they're from the um, controller board. Um, and then the next, there's two little spacers here, it's a little hard to see, but I was trying to visually separate the different voltages. This is Bob, this is the breakout board, so that's the controlling controller board here. And it's the only thing on my board that's 24 volts, so it gets its own little slot here. And same thing, one, one power on one ground, or one positive and one negative, let's just say. Um, and then the next uh, five items here is X, Y, Y prime, and Z. And then there's an empty one for future expansion if I ever want to add another axis. Um, so anyway, this wire is the 56 volt DC that comes in. And then each one of these um, drivers is separately fused. And this came in really handy actually because uh, one of the first things that happened when I uh, went to test this circuit is that one of my gecko drives was failing uh, straight from the factory and I'll show you a picture overlay. There's basically a, a manufacturing defect that was causing it to short to ground, basically the back panel. And so what it did was what, the moment I, I powered up my gecko drives, this fuse blew. Uh, I think it was in the X position at the time. And just, bah, since it's a flash, fast blow fuse, it completely protected the drive itself, even though there's a, a short in it. And, uh, uh, the guys at Gecko Drive replaced the drive really quickly, um, and I was off and running. But it was really helpful to both know that the this was working, and as well as that it was it protected the the drive itself, even though the drive is technically blew up. But <laughs> it it blew so fast that it gave me confidence that this was going to work well. So just a reminder to uh, do your amperage and wire gauge calculations carefully. Um, so in this case, the, this is 56 volt DC is coming in and it's powering all of the drives for each of the axes. So you just have to do your, do your math. Um, obviously this wire coming in needs to carry the current for all of these. So the gauge of this wire, this wire will have to be a bigger diameter and carry more current than the outbound ones. In my case, they're the same because I just overkilled. I think this is a 12, uh, 12 gauge uh, wire, multi-strand, both in and out. And I think for me, that should be more than enough. Um, you also need to make sure that you can actually get the terminal into the block. So these terminal blocks, uh, I think the maximum size is 10, 10 gauge um, or largest diameter. And so anyway, just manage all that up stuff up front so you don't have any surprises. Um, I think in my particular case, uh, I think 12 gauge is about as large a wire as I can get into the actual um, uh, gecko drives. Um, these 
these terminal blocks won't accept I think anything greater than a 12. It was a bit of a struggle to get those in. So it's just something you need to kind of be aware of. So pretty much all these circuits go uh, either to their destinations within the box or they go to these uh, field terminal blocks. So basically everything in my box, every wire that's coming into my controller comes in through right there and is attached to one of these field terminals. And uh, theoretically, I guess you could uh, delete this and just go directly to wherever you want, but I think it's best practice within a complicated box like this to have uh, field terminal blocks like this so that uh, yeah. wires that leave the box are have a cl clear and single location to come in. It's, I think, complicated enough without that. Um, and so I think I'll leave it at that. I'd say, um, you know, it's, it's sort of something to think about as you're, as you're doing your design is, is wire gauges, calculating wire gauges. And then I think one of the things that I mildly, I don't think I would do again is, is using these spring loaded uh, terminal blocks. They're kind of fussy and hard to work with. And the, the screw terminal ones like this one, this block here, just work a lot better and they don't take up that much more space. Um, so I don't think I'll use the spring clip ones. They, they are much cheaper, which is good. Um, but I think they're just harder to work with. Um, all right, so that's pretty much all I got there. Uh, I think this will end this series unless there are requests for special uh, coverage. Um, I think moving forward, we'll, we'll see what my <laughs> channel morphs into. Anyway, thanks for watching.